Hi, this is Professor Stugard, and today we're going to be coding along to our week five lab assignment. So, our week five lab assignment here, I have our blackboard open, and um, what we're looking at here in blackboard, um, we're going to be investigating a data set uh, that actually comes from the website 538. Uh, so the website 538 um, is a website that specializes in different kinds of statistical analysis. Uh, it was founded by Nate Silver, who became uh, famous for correctly predicting uh, a presidential election in every state a couple, well, a couple elections ago now. Um, and they do sports and politics and polling and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so the nice part is they've created their own uh, package in R that we're going to be using to do some data analysis. Um, and I suggest, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look when we get into uh, the R Studio a little bit. Um, but we're basically going to be investigating one of the uh, articles that they've written and the data set they used discussing majors and money. And actually, there's a bunch of really interesting variables here um, that we'll be looking at, uh, well, more than just this one lab. So I would suggest that you read through the article quickly um, from 538. You will notice that it was published in 2014. So the data is a little dated, um, but it's a good idea to kind of read through it, talking about, um, well, different majors and the salaries and, and unemployment rates and, and those sorts of things. Um, but I have my R Studio open. I took my lab and I already downloaded it. Uh, so I have it here in R Studio. Uh, let me make sure. Let me shrink myself down a little bit so that we can see the environment. Perfect. All right. So as always, we start install dot packages. Tidyverse in quotes. We'll let that get started. I need to upload my R Markdown file, which is in my downloads, majors and money. Open that up. All right. And we'll give it a second. Good. There it shows up in my files. Uh, let's see. Tidyverse is almost done. Or so it would seem. Well, always takes a while, right? Uh, well. So open the majors and money so we can take a look. Uh, as always, in the header, make sure you change the name and the date. And so again, the idea of this lab is that a college degree is not a guarantee of success. Uh, your college degree is really only an opportunity. The college degree will hopefully get you that interview, but it's up to you to, well, earn the job. And it's up to you to have hopefully spent your time in college wisely, uh, developing skills and experiences and things you can talk about in those interviews to hopefully get that job that you want. But again, that college degree is really just the starting point and the opportunity. It's never ever been a guarantee of any kind. Um, and so that's what we're gonna look at. So. Like I said, we're doing the tidyverse, and then again, 538 has its own package as well. So tidyverse, don't forget to do library tidyverse uh, as well after we um, install that package. Good, so all that loaded properly. Now we'll install dot packages, and then again in quotes because it is external. 538, um, and again, feel free to copy and paste the code from up there. Um, so that doesn't take too long. And library 538, and again, it starts to autocomplete for us. Uh, you will notice that again, we get a red message here loading the library. Um, it says that some of the larger data sets need to be installed separately. Um, and again, that's not gonna be a problem for our, uh, what we're looking at here. If you do a question mark for 538, um, it's really, really nice because again, it talks about um, this is the code and data sets that they use. So again, they're being very open and honest about how they come up with their conclusions. 
Um, and if you want to see all of the data sets, they even have uh, the link here. And if you click it, so again, it talks about the large data sets. And again, it has all these data sets. Um, so uh, again, over 100 data sets on a bunch of different uh, topics. And again, it links to each of the articles. And again, now that we've loaded this package, all of these data sets are available to us. Um, and again, as you're thinking about your final project, you might want to look through this list as well and see if there's anything in there that interests you. Um, and again, make sure it's a, you know, a decent sized data set. But, all right. We just want to look at, uh, again, the college recent graduates. So, um, two things. Let's first bring it into our environment and then we'll also use the question mark and look at it. So, uh, college recent grads, and I'm storing that called college recent grads. Um, again, sometimes I do like to, like I said, when I store it in my environment, do underscore DF, just so again, I'm very aware that it is a data frame. Um, just so again, we can kind of look at it. So this data frame looks like we have 173 observations, 21 variables. Um, so that's more variables than we've really dealt with so far. Um, so again, to get more reasonable answers, we will probably be selecting for specific rows for each of these questions. Um, and question mark, college recent grads, that data frame. Uh, so again, the economic guide to picking a college major, it links to the article there. The usage, data frame, 173 rows representing majors. So again, they looked at 173 different majors uh, in this data set. So the observations are for different majors. Um, and then the 21 variables. So the variables are the rank by median earnings, the major code, major, major category, total, sample size, men, women, share of women, uh, unemployed, employed full-time, employed part-time, employed full-time year-round. And again, it talks about all of these different variables um, that uh, again, we'll be taking a look at, well, just some of them in our analysis today. All right, so the first thing I want to do, like I said, I want to really explore this data set. So we're going to, one, import the data set into the environment as a tibble. That's what I did. So let us copy and paste that code here. So we'll import that data set. And then the code to see the first six rows. So we'll clear down on the console. So again, remember the first six rows, that's our head function. So head and then college recent grads on my data frame. Uh, and so again, just looking at the top, so we, we have our rank, major code, looks like petroleum engineering is there at the top. And again, this is ranked in terms of median salary. Uh, so yes, petroleum engineering is going to make you the most money, probably. And again, we have the total number of people who graduated with that major, which would be the number 2,339. Um, again, in the year that they, they did this uh, research. Uh, all right. And then the sample size, so 36. So even though 2,339 students graduated with a degree in petroleum engineering, uh, and I believe uh, this year, do they have the year that this was done? Um, I believe this was uh, the year 2012. I believe, so 10 years old at this point. Uh, so again, there's 2,339 people graduated with a degree in petroleum engineering and 36 people answered uh, the 538 survey uh, from which they were able to gather the uh, employment data. So again, it's only a sample of, um, again, about, well, a little more than 1% of the, the actual graduates, but again, it should be good enough for our purposes, right? Maybe, well. Let's we'll take a look at that a little bit more in depth. But, so let's copy and paste our code to look at that first six rows before we forget. So look at the header and then the code to see how the variables are stored. So, and a lot of variables for this one. Um, to see them all at the same time, the glimpse function is what we want to use. Because again, as we can see here, um, this is a table, even the header, there's 21 variables there's 11 variables that aren't showing up here on the screen at all. So, glimpse, college recent grads, uh, my data frame. 
All right, so we'll take a look at these. So again, rank, that's an integer. So again, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 173. The major code, that's useless for our purposes. The major, so that'll be important. The major category, so that's nice. They've grouped each of these majors into their own category. So there's 173 majors, but they all fit into one of 16 categories. Um, again, the total number of students enrolled as an integer, the sample size, so the students that responded uh, as an integer, the number of men that graduated, the number of women that graduated, uh, and then they did a, um, they did the math for us and created a column for what is the proportion of women in each major, so that would be the share women. Uh, then they have the number of students that are employed, the number that were employed full-time, part-time, year-round, the number that were unemployed, so that, that also gives us an unemployment rate that we can take a look at. Um, and then we have the percentiles for the salaries coming up. So the 25th percentile, the median salary, the 75th percentile, um, how many had college jobs, how many got non-college jobs, how many got low wage jobs. Um, and so again, a lot of good information for us to look at here. All right, but I'm gonna copy and paste my code for investigating those variables. So the glimpse code, all right. So again, the first thing we do, we inspect our data, we get an idea of it. Um, we did the question mark to take a look here. Um, and again, I would suggest that you actually pause this video and read through the whole thing yourself, try to understand these variables a little bit better. Uh, we looked at the head, we saw that it was way too big to actually see what was going on if we include all of our majors. And then we took a look at all of our, um, all of our variables. And again, as I look through all the variables, each one is stored properly as, uh, integers or doubles, depending on whether it's a whole number or it's a proportion, um, or a salary it looks like, and then obviously characters for majors and major categories. So, and everything looks pretty standard, looks like we don't do any cleaning up with this data. And again, that's the nice part about pre, uh, preloaded packages that someone else put together for us. All right, but there's definitely gonna be some missing data. So if I click this, well, and it's really hard to see here because it is a large data set. Looking at this as a spreadsheet is not super useful. So I do wanna get rid of my missing data if possible, but first let's figure out how much missing data there actually is. So again, we have 173 majors, so 173 rows, 21 variables. So if I take my college recent grads data frame and I use my drop NA function, so again, I'm just gonna pipe so that's a percent greater than percent. And if I do drop underscore NA as a function and just run it, again, it's not gonna change my original data frame, right? This is all just working in the console. Nothing's being saved or overwritten right now. Um, I'll press enter and it says, oh, now we have 172 rows. So there's only one row that was missing data in it. Um, and in fact, if we were to go through and look for the missing data, um, it is a fairly, um, let's see if we can find it here. Um, yeah, I can actually find it here. It was the food science major. Um, the food science major, which would fall under your agricultural and natural resources major category. Uh, we don't know how many students graduated with that degree. We just have the sample size. So not really a big deal if we lose them. Um, and again, there's some other missing data as well. We don't know the number of men, women, the share, of men and women, um, but we do know uh, some of the salary information. So again, we could keep it or not. In this case, since we have 172 other majors to look at, uh, let's just get rid of the missing data. So we did the drop NA. And again, if I wanna make this a permanent change so that I don't get error messages and warnings later on, um, and again, trying to remove that missing data, I do need to uh, overwrite that as college recent underscore grads underscore df and store it, right? I gotta overwrite and store my original data frame. And if I run my code now, we'll see in the environment, it goes from 173 to 172. So now we only have majors for which we have all of the data. So let's copy and paste that code as well in here for the missing data. All right. Now, uh, the next part, I talk about large data problems. And so there's a lot of variables in this data set. 
Um, again, not even close to the number of variables you might see in other data sets in the wild, as it were, and certainly not as many observations as you would see. Um, but again, when we have any data set that's this large and you can't see all the columns at once, we really do want to use the select function to really only choose the variables we want to see for the particular question. So basically every question is going to start, we have our college grads data frame, we're going to pipe it into the select function and then only choose the majors that we want. This will also be useful in those larger data sets too because we'll basically ignore all these missing variables and we'll have to run through things that again, hopefully shouldn't take too long. Now, um, optionally, and I'm not going to do this, uh, each of the proportions is stored as, well, a proportion, um, which means it's between zero and one. So they're all zero point something. Uh, if you want to view them as classic percentages, you can use the percent function to convert everything as well. Um, and again, that might make it easier to understand. We have a better intuition sometimes for numbers between zero and 100 than necessarily zero and one. We're talking about decimals. Um, but I don't think I'm gonna do that this time. I think we'll be just fine with the uh, proportions as proportions. So question one, um, well, how many graduates or graduates were counted in this study? So like we said, when we looked at the variables, there's two different values. There is uh, the actual size um, or the total number of people in the major, the no total number of people who earned degrees, and then we have the sample size, how many actually responded to this particular survey. So we got to figure out, um, well, how many there are in each one. So we're just going to use the sum function. Now, the sum function, and then later on when we do other functions as well, um, if I want to access just a specific row in a data frame, we use the dollar sign to denote that. Um, so again, I, have, I gave you the code here, but I'm going to type it in as well. If we do sum, so again, sum means add everything up. Well, I want to add up everything in that column in my, uh, well, college recent grads data frame. So I choose my college recent grads data frame, right? I, I tell the sum function, all right, I'm looking in this particular object, and then we do the dollar sign, so shift four, and now I want just one specific column. Add up all of the values in this one specific column. Um, so again, as nice as goes in auto completes for us, we want the total, so if I run total, uh, six, seven, seven, one, six, five, four. So that's 6.7 million. Um, okay, so uh, there's six, six million seven hundred and seventy one thousand six hundred and fifty four students graduated from college uh, in this study total. Uh, how many are in the sample size? So it's basically the same code, so I can just hit the up button. How many are in the sample now? Uh, so the college recent grads, the dollar sign, and then if I start typing, I want the sample size. Um, so sample underscore size, there we go, starts to autocomplete. I can run that code as well. And it looks like there were 61,566 students in the sample size. All right, so I'm gonna copy and paste that code for question 1B. Uh, you do need to uh, include that code. And so now we can answer how many graduates were counted in this study and is this a large enough sample size to make conclusions? So there are 6.7 million students considered in this uh, survey, survey of which 61,566 um, are included in our sample. So again, in terms of statistics definitions, the 6.7 million students would be our population. That's the whole group that we're trying to study. And then our sample, that small subset of our population is the 61,566 students, uh, which is, uh, that's a really good sample. To, to get 61,566 students to answer a sample, that's a really good amount. Um, this is large enough for us to use to make conclusions uh, based upon 
the data. All right. Uh, so question two. All right, which major has the lowest unemployment rate? All right, so college recent grads. Uh, you know, I'll use my data frame here and I'll pipe that into. So again, I want to figure out the lowest unemployment rate. So again, highest, lowest, we need to arrange. So arrange uh, in terms of the unemployment rate. So unemployment rate, again, if I start typing unemployment rate, good, it'll autocomplete for me. It's called the unemployment rate. Uh, and I run it, and oh yeah, this is that trouble I talked about earlier. It arranged it, um, but I literally can't see what the actual uh, unemployment rate is. I have no idea, because I mean, I can see the names of the majors and how many people, but again, that variable got cut off, and I actually want to see what that variable is. So this is why I said earlier what we're going to do um, is when we take our college recent grads, we pipe it in. The first thing I want to pipe it into is my select function. And so I want the major. I also want the major category. And then I also want the unemployment rate. Unemployment rate for this one. All right. So those are the three variables that I want. And now that I'm only selecting those three variables, now I will pipe it into my arrange function. And now I'll arrange by unemployment rate. Unemployment rate. Hit enter. Ah, and this looks a little bit better. Now I'm just seeing the major, the major category, and what the unemployment rate is. Um, and so we see that the, uh, the top major that has a 0% unemployment rate is mathematics and computer science. Um, Shocking, right? So if you study math and computer science, you, that's, again, typically a very difficult degree. You will find a job. Number two is military technologies. Uh, number three, botany. Number four, soil science, um, which I think is kind of interesting, right? So going into military tech, going into, again, the agricultural field, botany and soil science. Uh, then we have educational administration and supervision. Um, and then let's see, we also have engineering mechanics up next, court reporting, that is a popular one, uh, mathematics teacher, you're definitely finding a job there, petroleum engineering, and general agriculture. So again, I think this is kind of interesting. We're seeing a lot of math uh, and applied science degrees here, uh, particularly, again, in engineering, military, and then also agricultural. Um, turns out people need to eat, right? We need food. So let's copy and paste that code. So in the console, right, hit up to bring up my last line of code. We'll paste it. And what major had the lo lowest unemployment rate? Mathematics and computer science had the lowest unemployment rate. All right. Question three, what major had the highest percentage of women? All right, so uh, same idea, right? Now again, I wanna arrange my data. So college recent grads, my data frame, I will pipe that into, first of all, the select function, because again, I only want certain variables. In this case, I still want major, and oops, the major category. Nope, major category. Uh, again, I still wanna see those two. And in this case, now I wanna know um, the percentage of women. And so that is found by um, the variable share women. It's the, sh the proportion of women in the major. So share women. So those are the only three variables I wanna look at for this particular question. Then we'll pipe that into my arrange function. But now I want the highest percentage um, or the highest proportion. So I need to arrange in descending order. So we need the descending function as well and two sets of parentheses here. And now we'll arrange by share women. And if I run my code now, there we go. So looks like early childhood education had the highest uh, percentage or the highest proportion of women as majors, um, which I think that actually probably clicks with our intuition, right? 
Um, when we think of kindergarten teachers, we typically do think of women, right? Um, not men. Um, so let's see. And after that, uh, communication disorders, uh, sciences and services. So that seems like that would be, um, again, kind of helping people. Medical assisting services, so health, elementary education. Uh, so that's coming in at number four. So, oh, so pre early childhood, I believe, is preschool. So preschool teachers uh, have the most proportion of women, which again, that's 0 0.969. That means 96.9% .9 of all people going to be preschool teachers are women. There are very few men in that field. And then even now when we get to elementary education, which would be probably the K through four, K through five, um, even that proportion's in the 90%. And after that, we have uh, family and computers, uh, family and consumer sciences, special needs education, so we're back to education, then human services, uh, social work, nursing, and miscellaneous health professions. So it definitely seems like there's a pattern here. Um, the majors that have mostly women, we're looking at education, we're looking at teaching, particularly uh, younger kids uh, and special needs kids. Then we also have a bunch of health fields um, and then fields falling into the social work category as well. Um, so uh, it definitely seems like the majors that have the most women are the ones that are directly helping people face to face, right? All right so that code worked. We will copy and paste that code in here for question number three. And which major has the highest percentage of women? Early childhood education has the highest percentage of women at 96.9%. Um, yeah. Early childhood education has the highest percentage of women at 96.9%. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, we know which ones have the highest percentage of women. All right, question four. Describe the distribution of the median incomes by analyzing the summary statistics and then creating a useful histogram. Uh, your description should include the shape of the data, um, what the shape means, and if there's any outliers in our data set. So first things first, we wanna calculate the summary statistics. I did include all of this for you. Um, just because, um, well, I think it was easier this way. And also, we're looking at the median salary. So everybody who answered the sample size, they found the median, uh, the median salary of the people who answered the survey. So of the 65,000 people who answered the survey, each one is grouped into their different majors. And then from the people being grouped in their majors, the middle salary is the one they, they picked. Um, so again, we're looking at the, the variable for median. So again, you see the code here, everything with my summary statistics, we look at the minimum value of the median salary, the maximum value of the median salary, the mean, or again, typically the average of the median salary, and the median of the median salary, the standard deviation of the median salary, and then uh, Q1 and Q2 are quartiles, um, which again is, uh, we find our quartile by doing the median, and then, well, what, uh, what percentile that would have been. So again, I'm just going to copy and paste this code in the console so I can see it run. Um, and we can see now we have a table with our seven variables that we defined, the minimum, the maximum, the mean, the median, the standard deviation, Q1 and Q3. So we see that this, the minimum salary was 22000 The maximum salary was $110,000. Uh, but the average salary was 40000 the median salary was 36,000, and we had a standard deviation of about 11,000 there. Um, now note, if you wanted to, uh, you can also run your code in your R Markdown file. Uh, so over here, right, we have our code chunk that's a little bit gray. There is uh, that green arrow, kind of like the play button. And if you run it, it will run your code chunk for you and actually put it in your R Markdown file for you to see as well. Okay, so we have our summary statistics here. And now I want to create a histogram of this data. And with the histograms, we really do wanna always adjust our bin width as well. 
All right, but first we're gonna play around on the console. So, college recent grads df is my data frame. I will be piping that into, again, if I wanna create a graph, that is my ggplot function. So ggplot, the first thing we wanna do is our mapping or our aesthetics. So aes, again, that's its own function. Now in this case, I just want a, a histogram. We're only looking at one variable here. This is univariate data, one variable. So for this histogram and that one variable, everything is just along the x-axis. And then again, the histogram is gonna give us our frequency distribution. So x equals median uh, for our median salary here. Um, we don't really need to do anything else here. There's no y value. Again, it's only one variable, so there's only an x. Uh, we're not really grouping anything by colors, so that's probably good for that. Um, and then we add our layer, so plus, and then the geome underscore histogram. So, like I said, I suggest that we fill in the bin width. Um, if we just run the code as written without defining our bin width, um, it says, all right, we started with bins equal to 30. So they chose 30 bins instead of choosing a bin width, um, which is, I guess, acceptable too. Anything really between five and 30 is okay. Um, typically though, 20 is, is really the maximum so that again, hopefully you can see the data a little bit cleaner. Um, but again, I prefer to do it by bin width because this is, um, well, I don't know what the bin width is. I don't know what the, the groupings are. And again, I have my obvious uh, scale down there on my graph, but it is better to define our bin width. So in the genome histogram function, our argument bin width equals, um, and so we're talking about salaries, we're going from 20,000 up to 100,000. So if I go by 10,000 increments, again, that's gonna be less than 10 bars, um, and probably won't look, yeah, we definitely get an idea of the shape of the data here. And I think I'm gonna play around and change that to 5,000 though. I think that gives us a better a better look of what's going on here. Yeah, I think that's definitely the one we're gonna go with is 5,000. Um, but again, that's the nice part about our studio, right? Play around with that. You, you can hit the up button, bring up your last line of code, change the bandwidth to a bunch of different things. Try a bunch of different options and see what works best. Uh, you need to be playing around with this on your own, right? Pause the video right now, type in a bunch of different bin widths um, and see what happens. But again, this looks good for me. So I'm gonna copy and paste and preserve this code here for question 4B. All right, now based upon my summary statistics here and my graph, I wanna describe the distribution of this data. All right, so when I take a look at this data, Clearly we have our peak right here, and then it trails off. Now my tail is much bigger to the right. This definitely trails off and has a bigger tail on the right-hand side. So the shape of this data is skewed right. So the data is skewed, or I should say the data distribution for median salary is skewed right. Um, Definitely looks like we have an outlier though, doesn't it? Uh, so there's one bar way out here, way out here that's way higher than everything else. Again, almost everything else uh, looks like that would be roughly capping out at like 75,000 or so, um, right? Halfway in between 60,000 and 90,000. Everything caps out at like 75,000. And then we have this giant outlier over here, which is the petroleum engineering, right? That was the, the rank number one. That was my maximum salary of 110,000. There's only one major that is a way out there and it is definitely an outlier. Um, and even without that outlier, the data definitely looks like it would be skewed right anyway. Um, meaning that most people are grouped towards that middle, uh, but there are definitely some majors out here that are, are definitely going to earn you some more money, um, statistically speaking. So the data distribution for this for median salary is skewed right. Um, there is an outlier, um, which is the petroleum engineering major. Um, 
which is the maximum salary at $110,000. Um, and then let's put some of our summary stats here. So since it's skewed, we should do the median. Um, the median salary is 36,000 and the mean salary is about 40,000. Um, again, $40,151. Again, we can, uh, we can round here to the nearest thousand. Uh, so the median salary and the standard deviation Is what was that? Eleven thousand or so? Eleven thousand four hundred and seventy is eleven thousand four hundred and seventy dollars. So again, that's uh, how much uh, dispersion there is in our data set, how it is distributed. All right. Okay, so we have that done. All right. Question five. So now that we know that we have our data set, we know it's kind of skewed, right? Um, well, what effect does the choice of major category appear to have on our median income? So now I'm going to group everything by my major category. So if we look back at my help window, uh, major category, again, right, that's our category of major. Um, so let's take a look at that first. So, um, all right, so we'll start with our college recent grads data frame. We'll pipe that into, and again, the first thing I want to do is my group by, and I want to group by major, major category. Um, and if I just hit enter now, again, remember, grouping by does not change the data frame at all. Uh, behind the scenes, R Studio and the R programming language is grouping it, but we're not going to see those changes until we do something else with the data. Um, but I can see here uh, that there are 16 different major categories here. So there's 16 different major categories. So we're going to group by those 16 major categories. And then we'll pipe that into. Um, and I want to see what effect that has on the median income in each of those groups. So again, we're going to group by the major categories. That's going to group each of them together. And then from each of those now, bigger groups, we're going to find what the median salary is in each of those groups. So to display that as a table, that is our summarize function. Uh, and so I want to summarize, and I'm going to call this, so i got to, again, name what my, my column is going to be in my new data frame that I'm creating. Um, so the median, uh, so the average median salary. So average salary equals um, and I guess yeah we'll do the average we can do the median or the average um, let's see which one would make more sense so my data is skewed so typically with skewed data we should use uh, the median so we'll find the median uh, median salary of the median which I know is kind of confusing right so find, you're going to group all of the median salaries together. So the variable is median. And then the function we're going to do is also called median. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, and then we're going to, we want to arrange it in descending order. So again, I'm going to, I know I can pull this code up again in a second. So I'm going to press enter. And I can see now, ah, okay. It's arranged. Major category is actually arranged in alphabetical order. And I can see the average salary in each of those different groups. But again, I want to arrange it. So let's arrange. So I got to pipe those results in now. And again, right, that's why that piping function is so useful. It allows us to chain together a bunch of commands. So arrange, descending order, I want biggest one on top of, again, the new column in my new data frame, which remember I titled average salary. So AVG underscore salary. Press enter now. And ah, engineering is the top one with a median salary of $57,000. So you graduate with a degree in engineering, 
Um, and again, like I said, this data set's about 10 years old now, so it's a little dated, but for the most part, um, it's still the, the conclusions we can draw, even if the salaries have changed due to inflation um, and job markets, even if they changed a little bit, they, they wouldn't have changed so much to change the order or the ranking here. Um, but again, engineering comes in first at 57,000. The next closest is computers and mathematics at 45,000. Um, so that's a jump of like $12,000 right there. Then business at 40,000, which is not as big of a jump. And then physical sciences at 39,500. And we see much smaller jumps here. Um, you see quite a few at around 35,000 all the way down. It looks like the lowest paid one is psychology and social work. Okay, so I'm going to preserve this code now. So copy and paste it in for question 5a. Um, and again, I don't necessarily need to answer a question here because, again, when I run my code inside RStudio, it ranks it for me. So again, when we knit, my, knit the PDF together, we'll see this table um, and we'll see the data right there for us. Okay. Now I want to create another histogram, but I want to facet it by the major category. All right, and I want to keep my bin width consistent from that choice in question three. So I want to see, um, now in this case, um, what I want to look at now is uh, basically what the distribution looks if I group it by major category. So I'm going to actually now create 16 different histograms all faceted together using the facet wrap function because again I'm only adding one extra variable right if you're adding uh, two variables that you want to look at at the same time that's facet grid so we can get an X and a Y uh, but in this case we just want to look at just one extra variable we want to group everything by that major category and again the faceting is basically grouping by the major category now it's the same concept the facet wrap and the group by function are doing the same thing. Uh, it's just in the context of whether we're creating a data frame or a graph, but it's, it's really that same concept. Uh, now, I created my histogram. Um, where did I do that? Up here, right? So the nice part is it's the same idea. I'm now just faceting by the major categories so I can take my code that I already created and reuse it here. So I'm gonna copy and paste. All I need to do is add an extra layer. Um, and again, that's the great part about creating reproducible code. And again, any coding in general is going to involve a lot of copying and pasting. So uh, copying and pasting here, like I said, it's gonna be a facet. Uh, we wanna do facet wrap because it's only the one variable. We do the tilde, so that's shift tick mark, it's the one next to the number one. Um, and again, remember, this is how we typically write our explanatory and response variables, um, where it is in like the y equals f of x function type of idea, or y equals x. In this case, it would be, uh, again, your explanatory tilde x. So uh, again, we're not doing anything with the y, it's just the x. Uh, so facet wrap and now major, I'm out of space just to make it clear, major underscore category, uh, run my code, and boom, there we go. Now I have uh, 16 different graphs for the distributions of the 16 different major categories. Um, and again, just kind of visually inspecting this, we can see Oh, it looks like that interdisciplinary one, look at that, that's a tiny, tiny histogram with like one, really only one data point. So that must be a very small major category. Um, you can see communications and journalism, everybody is around the same. Um, engineering, ooh, engineering, that definitely looks, I mean, we knew from the summary stats that that was the biggest one, but we can see now visually that this is definitely the furthest to the right. And of course we have our outlier there that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. And again, visually inspecting this, I can see a few things. Again, I would suggest that you pause, take a look at this on your own, see what you see yourself. Um, take some time to look at visualizations and see what conclusions you draw. That's literally what we do as data scientists. Um, and then what kind of commentary we can make about it. All right, though, so let me copy and paste this code though before I forget. 
So that is question 5B. All right. Again, now is our commentary. So we did the uh, summary stats in part A. Part B, we created our visualization. And again, this is typically how we want to do data science. We always include A, the data that we use. So again, we've kind of included that table a bunch of times. So the data, our summaries, our numerical summaries, our visualizations, and then our commentary. We really need all four parts to be uh, an efficient data scientist or a proficient data scientist, I should say. Okay, so the major category with the highest typical median income I mean, uh, would be, again, engineering. So engineering has the highest typical median income. Um, and what conclusions can we make about the choice of major and median income? Um, so there definitely seems to be uh, some differences here, right? They seem to be mostly grouped. I mean, in fact, engineering has the widest uh, dispersion. It's definitely the most spread out. Um, but I would say that again, in general, most major categories um, have uh, closely grouped salaries. So again, that might be a good place. Again, if you're thinking about choosing a major, um, stepping back and saying, okay, well, maybe I don't know what exact major I want to be, um, but is there a category? Is there more of a general idea? Um, and we are seeing some, some uh, colleges move towards that with uh, meta majors or skill areas and those sorts of things. All right. So, um, like I said, they're all pretty closely grouped together, and that is a good place to start. Um, let's see. So our next question, um, do women tend to choose majors with lower or higher earnings? Uh, so we're going to look at the correlation coefficient, again, which is a very important tool to compare two different variables together to see whether or not there's some sort of relationship there. Um, now, the correlation coefficient is not the end-all, be-all. Just like I mentioned a second ago, we always include the raw data, our numerical summary, and the correlation coefficient is our numerical summary. And then we should also have a visualization as well, and then, of course, our commentary to really describe whether or not there really seems to be a relationship. Because, again, any one thing by itself is not necessarily good enough uh, to make our uh, arguments here. Okay, so... I have already typed in the code uh, for the first part, the correlation coefficient between share women and median. Now again, correlation coefficient, COR, is again the function for correlation. We are doing the same trick we did earlier with the sum, where you take your uh, data frame and then do the money sign and then the row. And then again, we separate those two with the, col with the comma. And I can run the code here. And N A. Why is that N A? Ah, I think I know why. So it's because we had this stored as DF. So underscore DF. We gotta make sure we have that the right way. Now when I run my code, ah, there's my correlation coefficient. Uh, negative 0.618. So when you get a negative correlation coefficient, that means it is negatively associated, which means it's going down. If we had a positive R value, that means it's going up. Um, so a negative one means it's going down. And a correlation coefficient, again, the closer you are to one, the more of a relationship there is. This time, this time we're at 0.618. Um, that definitely would indicate a correlation. And again, because of the size of my data set, I've included the, the critical value here. A correlation coefficient greater than actually 0 0.2 would indicate a less than 1% chance that our relationship happened by random chance. Again, doesn't mean it didn't happen by random chance, right? There's always that, that chance that, that it did. Um, but again, in this case, it definitely seems like there is a relationship here. So now I want to do a scatter plot that shows the share women along the horizontal and then the median salary along the vertical. And we're going to see visually whether or not there seems to be a pattern here. So my college recent grads data frame. I'm going to pipe that into, I'm making a graph, so that is uh, ggplot, 
I need to define my aesthetics or my mapping first. Again, I'm looking at two variables at a time now, so I, I do need to define my X and my Y. So X equals share women, Y equals the median salary. Nope, median salary. Um, I don't need to do any colors or look at any other variables. It's just those two. So plus, and to do a scatter plot, that is my genome point. Um, I could play around with the the dots, but let's take a look what it see what it looks like first. Um, okay, so there we go. Um, we definitely it kind of looks like we have a pattern here. Um, now, obviously that outlier that outlier is definitely sticking out like a sore thumb up there, isn't it? And so I actually want to exclude that uh, exclude that data point because. Again, it's really making the rest of the data kind of grouped up because it's so way out of whack. So what I'm going to do, uh, instead of excluding it from my data, I'm going to define my y-axis to just show me these particular values. So to change your x and your y-axis, that's just adding another layer to your graph. So take the code we already written, uh, plus, then shift enter down to the next one, and then I'm going to uh, define what my limits are for my y-axis. You can do this for the x-axis as well. Um, for the y-axis, it's y lim. The x-axis would be x lim. Um, and again, basically, again, we're defining what the limits are going to be for my y-axis. So I want between 20,000. Oops, I almost put a comma there. That was silly. Um, remember, the comma is how we separate arguments. And our studio does not care about spaces. So if you put the comma there, um, it's definitely going to get very confused. But anyway, I want it from 20,000, uh, and looks like a good cutoff on the top would be 80,000. And if I run my code now, and again, I do get my warning message. We removed one row, um, right, which is good. Our studio told me, hey, you just excluded some data. That's not really what you're typically supposed to do. But in this case, it's such an outlier. Um, and again, it comes from a small, um, that we really don't need to include it. And if I look at this now, it definitely seems like there is a downward trend to this data. It definitely looks like there is a downward trend. It's not on a perfect line, obviously. Um, there's definitely some variation, but it definitely looks like there is a downward trend um, that the more women there are in your major, the less money there is. All right, so let's preserve that code. Uh, and again, the nice part is when we run our, our markdown, it is going to include that we remove one missing data value. So you are going to know that that happened um, in your um, R markdown. Okay. So is there a correlation between the proportion of women in a major and the median salary? Well, yes. So part one, there is a correlation between the proportion of women in a major and the median salary. But then the second question, does this, does having a lower proportion of women cause a higher median salary? So if you have a lower proportion of women, um, let me get that back in my plot here. All right, if I have a lower proportion of women, right down here towards the lower end, does that mean the salaries, does that is that what causing the, the salary to be higher? And well, no, we can't claim that. We can never really claim causation. We can just show that there's a relationship in the data, but we cannot claim uh, that one necessarily causes the other. Uh, so, you know, all right, however, however, we cannot claim any causation. Um, and again, that's because, again, typically whenever you're trying to get cause and effect, we can't claim cause and effect without a much more detailed study because, um, well, we don't know what's the cause and what's the effect. Um, do women choose on purpose jobs that are lower paying? So does the lower salary cause women to flock towards that job? I mean, probably not, right? But that's one argument, right? That's one story you could tell with the data. Or um, does having more women in a particular uh, 
major mean that the employers are definitely going to pay them less? I don't know. But again, that's just a separate story. It is equally as valid, meaning not valid at all, as the first one. Um, or again, there could be some third variable we're not accounting for. Um, maybe there is some third variable. Uh, maybe the third variable is that women choose professions that try to help people one-on-one -on -one, and unfortunately professions that help people one-on-one -on -one do not pay well and it has nothing to do with each other. They're both related to some third variable. So again, I just created three stories based on this same data, none of which are valid, or at least we can't claim that they're valid because you can make up a story for anything. All we can do as data scientists is point out the patterns, and once we find these patterns, then that is the jumping off point for more research. So again, we see the pattern here, someone should do more research. Um, why is it that, again, the jobs with more women pay less? Does it have something to do with the jobs themselves? Does it have something to do um, with some grand conspiracy across all majors everywhere? I don't know. We can't claim that. That's not our job. Our job is just to point out patterns. Okay. Uh, last question to wrap this lab up. Is there a correlation between the total number of graduates and higher earnings? So now I need to find the correlation coefficient between the total number of graduates and then the median salary. And then that's part A. And then part B, we're going to create a scatter plot like we just did here. So the code, COR for the correlation. We're looking at our college recent grads data frame, so DF. Then the dollar sign. And then the first column we're going to look at is total and comma and space. So again, my first variable is the total. Uh, and again, you do have to define these in terms of explanatory and response variables. So we're going to say that total is my explanatory. Um, and then college recent grads data frame, dollar sign, and now the median salary. And I run that code. All right. So hmm, that correlation coefficient does not at a at a point 0.1 or negative point 0.1 I should say. So negative it does say that there's a negative correlation, but that number is so small it's less than point 0.2. That means there's not actually a pattern to this data, right? Well, it means there's not a linear pattern to this data. So I'm going to copy and paste this code. Copy and paste that code. So, again, if I rely on just the numerical summary, there's no pattern to the data. Uh, or uh, there's no linear pattern to the data. But again, let's let's create that scatter plot here. Uh, because again, one numerical summary is just not good enough. So college recent grads data frame, we'll pipe that into ggplot. My aesthetic mapping, my x variable now is the total number of graduates, comma my y variable is the median salary again. No fancy things with colors here. Um, we add our next layer. So again, we're doing a scatter plot. So geom uh, point. I'm not changing anything else here. I'm just going to go with the plain black dots again. Um, and then, uh, well, we'll run our code. But again, we're probably going to want to get rid of that outlier again. Ah, so is there a pattern to this data? Well, yeah, like I said, we have that outlier. So let's add that layer. Y limb again is going to be between 20, I almost did it again, 20,000 and 80,000. Run my code. So is there a pattern to this data? Well, it kind of seems like there is, except that there are a huge grouping of majors that have very few people in it. And these majors that have few people, we have a gigantic wide variety of salaries. So again, all these smaller majors have a wide variety of, of salaries, but I think we can see as we kind of start to go out, as we start adding more and more people to the major, there seems to be kind of that downward trend a little bit. Um, there definitely seems to be a pattern. Now again, the, the correlation coefficient does not capture that pattern because it's one thing, it's one numerical summary. And I think the scatter plot does a little bit better. So again, I'm gonna copy and paste that code. And now we got to answer that last question. 
So I will leave that up to you. You need to answer that last question. Is there a linear correlation between the number of graduates and higher earnings? Um, and if not, are there any patterns to the data? So type up that answer yourself, then knit this all together as a PDF and submit it on Blackboard. Um, again, like I said, don't forget, change the names and the date as well. Also a good idea, uh, name your project as well. Right, This is our week five lab or whatever you want to call it. Uh, maybe even a better descriptor than that. Um, but yeah, take your time. If you have any questions on this, please let me know. Um, good luck and take care of yourselves.